Hello Microgrinders, Alton Microgrinder and Reg from Microgrinder.com back again with another video on our How to Beat Microsake 6 Max 10 and L series. Uh, this should be episode 6 in our series. In our last episode we had Reg 2 tabling um, two tables of the speed poker on 10 and L for the party poker fast forward tables. Today what he'll be doing is he'll be going back to the 888 poker network and what we have up and running is um, one snap table which is their speed version of poker and then a regular 6 max table. Table. The main difference between the two is what you'll notice as reg plays is that on the snap poker, the speed version for 888, they don't allow the use of a HUD. So he'll be focusing on population reads for the most part. Um, and then on regular tables, he'll be able to utilize his HUDs. So reg, I'll hand it over to you. And um, I guess I can ask you some questions as some interesting spots come up. Hopefully. Any hopefully. I'm not sure if you caught that right at the start of the video. Well, I got check raised on this board. I isolated with the A6. This guy limped. I isolated. I put just over half pot bet on the flop. And this guy put a really small check raise. And it was, I think it was basically a min raise plus one big blind. And I would sometimes contemplate calling there because of just because of all my backdoor equity but when people do that they typically just bomb the turn and there isn't really I kind of wanted to see two cards not just one right yeah. if, I, if I say the eight of clubs or the seven of clubs came off and he bombed it for like four dollars or something I'd be in a situation where I kind of like probably have to call well knowing I can never win the pot unless I hit Right, yeah, I, I see. So I so it just gets too expensive. I just see typically people do that. They make a small raise and then they just blast in. And I presume he's probably, when he's making that sign of raise, <clears throat> I presume he likes his hand because he didn't like his way to fall any time soon. Which yeah. is why I just selected to just get out of the hand there. And then in this in this pot here, <clears throat> Ace 10 wouldn't be a typical hand that I would three bet, but this guy's playing 90 50 or 89 50. It's an absolutely clear slam dunk value three bet. And now we're just going to hopefully try and sugar someone in the pot and hope he's got something he can continue with. And against what we've just seen on the other table where I folded to a check min raise, uh, this situation is completely different. This guy is an absolute maniac. Of course I could be beat here. He could have Jack Queen, he could have Ace King, he could have a set, but it's just so unlikely and it's just so more, much more likely that I've got the best hand. So I'm happy just to ship it in for value. And you just have the the hand that beats us. Well, that's life. That is just life. I mean, when somebody's playing 90-50, <clears throat> if they're going to cool you like that in a three-bet pot, you're just going to have to lose your money. There's yeah. absolutely nothing else you can do there. No. What's a bit is a three-bet in pre. A three-bet in pre is completely standard against somebody like that. Now, there's a lot I mean, like I said, I, I wouldn't, three bet that against many players but against this guy and then when I flop top two against him as far as I'm concerned I'm cold and yeah. he just happens to have in a guy of the like hand that, that's got the cure for mine right a guy like that when he's at the top of his range he's playing 90-55 um, ace-king's the very top of his range so there's no way you're going to get away from you know two pair on the flop on a board like that oh I mean that was the minute I get check raised I mean I'm not loving even though he's He's a maniac. We're still not loving life. No, you're because, not Because, you know, life. it's it's still quite not that hard for me to be beat. But having said that, I'm still more than happy to show four value because he can have ace jack, ace queen there, but the same way, king ten. He can have so many worse hands than me still that he's added it for value with or as a bluff. Or it could be semi bluff in some draws. I mean, there's just way there's just way too much you can have and there's way too many ways that I've still got the best hand. Yeah. And I think like you said, if you look at the combinations of hands that has a lot of equity on there but you currently beat, there's probably just as many or more of those than the hands that beat you. There's you know, mm. with the removal of the aces and the tens with you having them. There's not that many combos of ace king that beat you. There's not many combos of aces, kings or tens he would have you know he wouldn't have played him that way pre-flop, so... Yeah. No, well, he's a maniac. I mean, if he has any... I just don't think he has a set there ever. 
No. Because they're just like you it's a pretty style player. Exactly. So it's, it's literally, it's Jack Queen or Ace King are the only two hands I'm scared of. And whatever, he had one of them, who cares, you know, you move on, there's absolutely, there's, there's been no mistake made there, uh, there's nothing to, to bitch and whine about, it's just one of them things. Yeah, exactly. And so, getting back to, you know, let's talk a bit about exploitive play against this 9055, what's your strategy going to be in the session playing against him? Three bit him really wide for value, all the time, and then just look to stack off pretty much if I if I hit any a strong second pair or a or a, a good top pair just just not fall to and just try and get shovel money in the pot that's pretty much going to be my strategy against this guy I'm turning up whether to fall back call it off I mean it's quite strong I've been I've raised middle position is three bit from the butt and I expect his range to be strong reasonably strong and he's stacking off range probably not, I'm probably what we're doing great against it with Ace King, but having said that, I don't particularly want to call check fold. <clears throat> I think you can still get value now for sure. And if he shoves on me, I'm just going to rely on the fact Ace King's a strong enough hand to call the shove and just I'll let the poker boss decide who's going to win the pot. Because I don't really see any, any better options. If it was suited, I could perhaps think of playing it slower. <clears throat> and. Um, you're flopping some draws and I can be aggressive with or maybe get away from the hand if it completely pricks for me but with it being off suit you're not going to flop as well as well. and on top of that Ace King off isn't really that strong of a hand given uh, given the positions we're in right now which uh, I've raised middle position I have no reason to think this guy's in any way manic he could just have queens there and obviously I can't fold but when I brick I tend to lose the pot most of the time and I just, I just I'm not explaining this very well I'm, I'm aware of that but the bottom line is what else can I do I'm either going to fold I mean it's great it's good for him <clears throat> but um, I really don't see what, what my other option is there with Ace King off suit in particular no I don't I don't see how you can get about him folding which I'm clearly never going to fold um, calling and then breaking the flop 70% of the time I mean that doesn't appeal to me and as I said I believe I can get some very thin value pre-flop <coughs> and also making fold some better hands albeit you know like marginally better because most of the hands is folding that's better than me of flipping with or about flipping with and as every example if it's 3 bet in 10s there 3 bet fold in 9s 10s I can sometimes get him to fold them or fold them post-flop on right. particular on certain boards, right? I think you know anything tens or smaller, he's going to be three bet folding to your four bets. So it's a good way to take down you know dead money where he's not going to call four bet pre flop and it has equity against you. And then you know the hand post flop, I think is pretty much played itself out. I don't think there's any way you can get away from it post flop. Against this guy up here, I was just kind of. I don't tend to see bet with these guys, but when it comes to SXX it's kind of it's a mandatory C bet and I'm not going to try and bluff him now I don't try and bluff people who don't have four buttons and we're just going to give up on the hand and move on for our viewers can you quickly go over um, what the HUD stats are the HUD stats are VPIP, PFR, Steel sorry I'll go along the top line without bringing the pop-ups up uh, VPIP, PFR, Steel then 3-bet, then 4-3-bet. to And the bottom line is just simply C-bet flop. So the pop up came up then. Fold to C-bet, and then C-bet turn. As you can see, this guy's got a 0 fold to C-bet up to now. Over 7 instances. So maybe the ASI C-bet wasn't the best plan against him. <clears throat> but having said that, he's just pretty much got almost 100% of cards in his range. So he's just going to have to fold. I mean, even though he's not folding, at some point he's going to have to fold. <coughs> yeah, I on agree. his side boards because he just he just doesn't have anything most of the time there. Right. If he's never folding a C bet, every time you have a a semi decent value hand or better, you're just going to want to value town him 100 percent of the time. And then of course you're seeing that he's C betting 100 percent of the time as well. So you can properly float him a lot, I think, as well.
So this guy, my notes basically say he's got a history of slow playing hands, but he does, according to my notes, check raise turns. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bet, and then if he doesn't raise, I'm going to absolutely bomb the river. Because I believe if he doesn't raise me here, he's going to be at the weaker parts of his range. Whereas if he does raise me, well, then it's, it ties in with the note that I've got. Um, here against this guy, I'm not sure if C-betting's actually, but well, we know it's probably not going to work. So that was just a question of do I C-bet reasonably small to sort of like try and set my own price? Or do I check to him? And then maybe he checks back. And I, I think just C-betting is small. And this is like how we can play exploitably. We can just see that small here, just to, and the, the intention of it is to prevent him from making a bet. So it is our check, and he bombs 80 or 90 cents. He's going to try to set your own price for your draw. Now I've hit this. I'm confident now that my 10 is the best hand. So now I'm going to change from just plot betting to value betting. So you'll actually see the size of my bet increase quite significantly. Because now I'm value betting, for trying to get value from draws. 8x, of course he can have a jack, but his range is so wide, it's not worth considering. The, um, you know, it's, it's just such a small part of his range. Over here, I'm just going to bomb c because if I'm c to two people, my range is just, by definition, a lot stronger than c in one player. And here, and now I have to, all my hand is in a bluff catcher, really. I could get some value from two pairs. Right against somebody who's aggressive as this guy, or who he thinks is aggressive as this guy. Although, having said that, on these notes now, it's only the flop where he's aggressive. So uh, my hand is now better than the bluff catcher. And I'm going to bet and then probably fold if he raises. Unless he been raised or something like that. Yeah, I think you have to get some. Because he looks get some aggressive. Value. This is like. A good example for people who are watching how to use your hood, because this guy looks dead aggressive. He's all purple, which is, indicates aggressive in the way I've got my colour scheme set up. <clears throat> so my first instinct was, this guy's aggressive. It's a really coordinated bot. It's going to be hard to get called by worse. So let's check to the aggressive guy. But then, when we looked at his aggression frequency, he's like, on the flop, he's like pretty aggressive. But then he tones it right down the turn of the river. Right, and so it just means he's just he's just not likely to bluff there. Right, by the turn so of the river versus a miss you bet, it's next to nothing. So, so if yeah. the guy's not going to bluff, we against the ones that bad, we need to be value betting. This is just an absolute classic textbook squeeze spot, regular regular type opener, being called by a really big fish. Normally, would make it twelve because this guy's in the pot. I'm going to make it fourteen, and I'm going to expect to be called almost a hundred percent of the time by this guy. But I just don't think he's into folding. <laughs> and now with my two overcards, my back door flush draw, I'm just going to value bet this guy. If he raises me, I have a bit of a problem because he didn't raise the last hand, which suggests he's maybe not massively big into semi bluffing these kind of boards. But I think betting's clearly best option because there's going to be so many turn cards we can barrel. That being one of them. Now it's just a matter of do I just jam it in and then hopefully he folds a seven or a five, or do I think this guy's never gonna fold a seven or a five? Well I think it's have to jam because this board hits me so hard here. I can't be check folding here too often. So we'll just go for it. And hope he finds a fold with a seven or a five. If he I mean obviously he's not gonna fold a jack, I don't expect him to fold a jack. That isn't the purpose of the bet. I would expect him to pull a jack a reasonable amount of the time there, to be honest. Not that I, not that guy. I wouldn't expect that guy to fold a jack. Well, the reason that I think that he would potentially fold a jack when you overbet jam like that is that <laughs> when you three bet squeeze pre flop um, and he calls and the king hits a turn, that disrupts such a strong force in your range. And on this right hand table, this guy's min three bet me. And then call my four bet. Normally it's a slam dunk C bet against this guy, but if you notice the stack size and the pot size, I'd rather set up just a check shove. Because I can still get the money in by betting the turn in the river anyway. This way I give him a chance to try and make me fall. I kind of rep pocket kings here when I do this, when I check. So I, can, I might induce some bluffs. 
Right, and the Very. other issue there too with you not see betting, which well, and he had quads as well, which is wonderful, um, is that you have the the ace high of diamonds, so you block any any nut flush draw there. So um, if you fire away on the flop, then he's probably just going to fold, and that way you just yeah. I just don't think, on, on ace xx. I just don't think I think it's going to be hard to be. He might be bad enough to just call it off with nine set. Who knows? But um, on ace xx. Um, in a four bet pot, and the stack to pot ratio is about 1.5. We have no problem getting the money in with two bets, so we can afford to check the flop and induce that kind of thing that happened there. Now, if we were, say, we had 10 more dollars to get in, I would never take a chance and check that flop. I would just bet. Well, because the stack to pot ratio is so low, I'm not really risking anything. I mean, I've got top set. If a diamond comes off, I've got the redraw anyway. Yeah, exactly. I'm not really risking anything by giving a free card. And what I do by checking is I represent queens and kings, basically. And if he's the adventurous type who do try, who wants to try and make me fold them hands, the only way he can really do it is by me checking and hoping to induce that. And he may well have done exactly that with his pocket nines. He may well have decided, you know, this guy doesn't have an ace, so therefore I'm just going to make it. He might not be thinking I'm going to make him fold pocket kings up. He might not be putting him in a, such an an accurate range or such a narrow range but he might just be thinking right I'm just going to try and end the pot now because I don't want to see a king or a queen or something like that so I think we just bet to end to end pots which is obviously not a good reason to do it but you see tons of, of weaker players doing that they kind of it's for protection it's just to like, end the pot now it's it's not, never really for value and if you ask them why they're doing it because I've asked quite a few people who work with that to do it and they say I just wanted to end the pot which is kind of not a good reason to bet. Right, he essentially turns his nines into a bluff there. Yeah, well, he is. that's exactly what he's doing because we're never ever, it's not like we're ever going to just fall pocket tens there in that spot. No. If I've got pocket tens there, uh, yeah, I'm sick that the ace has come. I'm really annoyed that the ace has come. But having said that, again, with a stack to pot ratio of 1.5, I'm just in a four bet pot. I'm just not going to fall because one overcard comes, even though it is the, the scariest overcard in the deck. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Here against this guy. Um, my range needs to bet this flop. I'm not a big fan of it because I've got literally no equity when I'm called. But having said that, we are deep. So if I make a large C bet, he could start me worrying about how many more large bets he has to call, which could dissuade him from floating with, with like worse hands. So he might do, if I was to make, say, a 40 cent C bet, his range, his raise there is, well. I don't know what the heck it's supposed to indicate. But when we're this deep, he should never be making that sizing, and that's kind of what I mean, the issue I have with this race here. Of course it's going to be full. I have nothing. I, you know, I'm not bothered that he's done it, but for, for people, when we are in spots over 200 blinds deep, we need to be considering that when making our bet sizes. Because if he has got a value hand here, he's just doing a rubbish job of building the pot. If he's got a bluff here, and he's trying to be full an ace, He's not making a good job of it because we just got so much money behind. And the whole point of making a bluff raise is to threaten people's stacks, make people worried that they're going to commit all of their stack. He's not doing that with this bet size. You know, if I had an AC, I'd have a really easy call. If he made this raise to $2.30, I'd have a hard call because I'd be thinking, well, what the heck? You know, what, what if he bets four on the turn, then jams the river or whatever? And he's just not doing a good job of threatening my stack as a bluff and he's not getting value when he's got, you know, when he has got a set or two pair or whatever. So his size in there was, it was there's no way it's just atrocious. I don't like really using such strong words, but he's just clearly not considering stack depth at all there when he's making that size. Yeah, and you made a good point. We talked previously and you said for, for people that are, are kind of concerned with um, re-raises, um, a good quick option is just to hit pot and kind of go backwards from there. You never just want to do a min re-raise. No, well, I, I, the only reason I will ever do it is if I'm going to have no problem getting the money in the turn of the, or I think I've got a guy who is going to spew, should I do that? But I need a specific read or a specific like setup on the on the stack size to do that. And then I made a similar size race that other guy just made then, but the stack size were a lot smaller and it's a lot trier board. This guy, again, for the same reason I see bet, people see bet the ace X, X nearly all the time, because you kind of have to. You know, you race, you're ripping a big hand pre-flop, 
it's kind of almost mandatory to see like, the ASXX in modern poker, which kind of then, especially blind versus blind spots like that, it kind of almost makes a three bet, uh, sorry, the flop raise mandatory too, especially when we have some equity with our good shot. Yeah, with the times um, that he does have an ace like, if he has like ace nine there for example I'm not expecting to fold it and I wouldn't continue barreling through the streets but I have my little bit of e equity with a good shot right, so, um, even if and you have... he doesn't have to have the ace so I think I have fold equity and a little bit of pot equity which is all I need to make a bluff yeah it's, I think it's even a standard C bet if you have something like pocket sixes or seven eight suited um, it's just that stereotypical ace high scare board yeah, well, I mean, you have to. I mean, you just see, but in the ASX, it's 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 pretty much is mandatory. So if it is almost mandatory, we need to have the cure for that in our toolbox for when it's done against us. In here, I don't think I've ever got the best hand here, but when people are making it one big blind to call bets, again, just, we just have to call down and. There we go. I mean, he may, we, we may have theoretically misvalued there. Obviously, we can never raise. Um, it's just when people are just bad at getting money in the pot like that, we're never making a mistake by just calling. We just right. treat it as checks and then respond to how we would respond to a check. So, well, therefore, if we, getting... if we wouldn't bet versus a check, we just call them in bet. And that's kind of just how, how I play them pots. Just treat me in bets as checks. <clears throat> right. And when you're getting. Nine to one pot odds. There, you can never fold with with a pair. You know, you could hit a ten or an eight, and you're pretty much getting priced in with good pot odds there. So. Yeah, and that's and that the way that hand played out just absolutely demonstrates that too that the guy had absolutely nothing. So we can't afford, we can't allow him to make really cheap bluffs like that to get us to fold. I have yeah. the strongest third pair, of course. In a pair of tens on that board there, it's not a strong hand. We're not in love with it. If he bet properly, we would almost certainly have folded it at some point. Right, and I think <clears> even but we can't on a, allow that strategy to work against us. Yeah, and if that was a dryer board, you could probably just even bluff raise him there with your tens and get him to fold the majority of the time. But giving that turn, he was never folding with the flush draw and the gut no. straight draw. And if these were regular games, I would put a note on him now saying that he plays the nut flush draw that out of position. And then perhaps we could raise, make some raises against him for thin value. Obviously, we'd need to know how he reacts to the raise. He might get super excited and just fall better three bets, which obviously would be a big disaster if we're going for some thin value against him. But these are just the pieces you put together. The more you play with people, the more you get one read on them, and then one read leads to another, because when you have that read, you adjust to it, you make a specific play against someone, and then you learn how they react to that too which therefore gives you a, a secondary read on them. And this is how just how we build up against these type of players. And this is why it's it's a lot more beneficial to play on sites where you know who the players are from session to session. Um, I'm just going to call this open here from this guy because he's not going to fold to a three bet. No, he's not. So there's not really, no point in making it. This guy has put a really small four bet in here. Sorry, three bet. That's the and same guy that men, men raised you on that flop on the king ace. Board. Just got a call here because I don't really like my options again because of stack depth as much as anything. Um, it's cat attempting to race here, but at 200 big blinds, it's less exciting. But I'm still no, I'm not going to do it. I kind of want to. I'm worried that if a six comes, I'm not going to get any action, or a jack comes. Uh, when he makes this bet here. I'm going to make a very small race for value. Normally, I, I advocate making my like you said, if I was a real value hand, I would go pot, and I'd just throw it back a bit, because now I'll be making a race size in relation to the size of the pot. But I just called there because of the time I was running down and I panicked. Um, but typically there, now I am going to race for thin value. Yeah, I think you always have because to I think, get called, I think we can get called by ASX. I think so. I think if you go thin exactly. enough, you get called. ASX off a chop and if he calls me down with a better pair fair play to him but I would have raised that turn but didn't value there because when he min bets a turn he can't really have a better hand than mine no and so you've gotten into two hands here where you've had people min bet you and um, it's always a sign of weakness I'd say about 99% of the time can you yeah. look at his hand in your hand replayer and it'll show you what he had 
Yeah, yeah. As I say, I thought he'd call for a chop on everybody. So is Queen. And so that's just, you know, the stereotypical, I'm going to bet one big blind and hope that they call so I can see another card for essentially free. You know, it's just the basic strategy there that you'll see with a lot of these bad players. Uh, some of them will do it as an alternative to check rating, but you'll soon find out who these players are. Yeah. But I would say a majority of them, just from population reads, is going to be the exact opposite. It's always going to be a weak hand or over cards or some sort of draw, and they want to get there for cheap. A three bet this guy, because he looks like he's like a, a fishy regular type player. It's a small sample size, but he has folded to the only three bet that he's faced. So I thought I'd go for the three bet, and now I'm just going to see bet this. Just because I don't think he has that much ace in his range. I think he's way more likely to be pocket pair heavy, uh, like connected cards heavy. So therefore, I'm happy just to, to bet there, represent the ace, pick up the pot. This guy's bet to me then checked. I'd be surprised if I don't have the best hand. And if I don't have the best hand, I definitely have the best draw. Or almost certainly have the best draw. So therefore, he's going to bet. And expect him to fall most of the time. If he raises, we can still call. Is because of our flush draw. This is quite an interesting river because I think his most likely hand here is a hand like ace jack, possibly ace queen, something like that. But I don't think we can bet really big here because, yeah, I just think if he has a king, he probably has a better king. So we end up value-warning ourselves. And I'm kind of wanting to target the ace-jacks in this range. So I'm just going to bet quite small and just give him an enticing call with an ace-jack type hand. And if he's got a hand like king nine or something, which is unlikely when he's risen to the corner, yeah, he should have missed a little bit of value. But I guess his overall range of may play of value. And he had exactly ace-jack and I'm really pleased yeah. that happened. It makes me look way better at poker than I actually. <laughs> but, um, that's, that's, it, that's it, a really that's good... just basic hand reading. Yeah, and that's a good example of your hand being a little thinner than than you most people would think it is. Because what are you going to call, get called by there? You're only going to yeah. get called by Ace Jack. And this is where people make that mistake of not many worse hands can call, so I won't bet. But you know, in the trip king doesn't matter there. The, the third guy actually relevant. You know, people have all got trips now. It's still our hand hasn't improved, you know. It's uh, exactly. still way. It's like a way ahead, way behind type situation still. Yeah, and, but um, it's a perfect spot for a thin value bet. You have to thin value bet there. And on and, top of and, that, if he's thinking, we can have less kings in our range now, obviously as well, because there's another king on the board. So if I was him, I'd be thinking, well, um, there's a lot of queen ten in this guy's range. There's a lot of, of other draw drawy type things he can have, some yeah. good shots and what have you. Ace queen, so queen therefore ten, queen ten. I mean, there's so many draws that you just a lot of draws miss missed, on. and I have less kings now because another king's come on the board. So if he's thinking, you know, he pretty much has to call my bet there. I've, I've given him a price that he can't really turn down. No, not at all. So I'm really quite pleased with the way that hand panned out, and hopefully now we get to isolate this guy and play quite a big pot with him, and the sessions turn down slightly because, as usual, as our ten and our videos go. I started off running pretty much like a drain, which is always fun. I almost mentioned it to you and Sniggered because um, it's just a joke me and Alan have. The last three videos I've made, it's cost me about $90 in lost earnings. <laughs> and um, I thought this one was going to go the same way, but hopefully it's not going to now. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, you know, you lost a couple of buy-ins, but you've already got that back in a matter yeah, of and it's, I'm not worried minutes. by it. I, I just found it for the, the, the amusement sake of, yeah, me and Alan are making another video, and I was going to spend half an hour running into the top of people's ranges, which we would have laughed about off tip. I'm just calling here because why would I raise? Um, because this guy, he don't bet half the time. If I had a heart, I would almost certainly call here. Because I don't, I'm just going to give up. Here I'm going to raise because that bet isn't big enough. On the flop, I was happy to call, but when he just does that again, when people bet the same size on the flop and the turn, it's usually an indication that the, the strength of their hand hasn't changed. <clears throat> so therefore, unless you've got ace-10, I'm pretty confident. I've got the best hand, and therefore I want to get more value for it. Yeah, I think you have the best hand 100% of the time here. 
And again, now, unless he's got to, unless he's got the 9-10, which is possible, I think 9-10 or 8-10 are the only two hands I'm scared of. Um, he could also have like hand like Jack Queen and whatever that he's obviously never going to call a bet with. But again, I'm going to bet smallish because I don't think he's got that much he can call us with. No, you're hoping to get called some like a Jack 10 or a Queen 10 there. Yeah, something like that. But he just folded, so I'm presuming he had to draw. But that is a very reliable sizing tell. If people, particularly when they're donk betting like that, if they donk the same size flop and turn, it's usually an indication that their flop hand strength, he liked it more on the flop than they did the turn. So there, it means it hasn't improved. Or because they've been called, they're less confident in their hand. And it's usually a reliable tell of it's not that much of a strong hand, which is why I felt able to raise the turn for value. Yeah, it, you know, that's essentially a blocker bet on his part. He wanted to prevent you from betting a larger amount. Um, you know, and when he called, I'm assuming he'd have something like a queen jack or um, a gut, gutter to the straight. He could have had 9x2 that he just called the turn with and hoped I shut down on the river. Yeah, that's true. Or pocket sevens. I mean, who knows? It, it was just right. quite obvious he was weak. And it's also a good example of why we probably shouldn't be going raising blocker bets as plus too often because I've lost so much money doing that in my lifetime. Where I'm like, well, this guy's putting an obvious block bet out. Therefore, he must be bet folding. So I raise and then they get the full part wrong and they just look me up and, yeah, and, um, in theory, that's one of the things where poker theory and practice don't marry together too well. And that's, and I think raising block bets is probably one of the most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's probably the most famous one of the lot for, for things that, in theory, they should fold, in practice, they don't fold. Perhaps the other one would be people who don't fold to three bets out of position as much right. as they should. And another one where you think you should fold more than he does. And um, you see it on forums all the time, he can't have this because he would have done this. Um, and typically those spots are the ones where people definitely make mistakes because the theory and the practice just do not marry together at all well. No. So much of it is really player dependent and having yeah. reads on them. I mean, I mean theory you can't just go people... based off of basic theory and say he can't have that in his range. Well, oh, every single you. poker player is different and they play differently. I mean, theoretically, when people bet one third part out of position on a river, theoretically that is a, they're taking a bet forward line. You know, for all intents and purposes, that's what it looks like. But well, people just aren't that good at folding. Yeah, exactly. Especially at the micros when it, it's in terms of the actual monetary amount, it's so little for so many people. And it, they're here for, you know, just to have a good time and play recreationally. Yeah, they want and to they, see flops, turns, and rivers. And they get curious and they want to see what's happened to them. Exactly. And if, and if, if call, making a, a $1.80 call, you know, she was their frustration. It's, it's probably worth it to them. You know, they're probably thinking, oh, I just want to know. And it's only $1.60, so I want to know. So they make a mistake and then end up winning the pot and they're probably happy as a, as a who knows what. Right. Yep, I agree. So we are coming up on 33 minutes. Um, went over our 30 minute allotment time. Let's do this ace king hand and we'll go ahead and, and finish up this video. It might be finishing quite quickly. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. It finished quickly. Unfortunately, he didn't re-raise you. Um, but I think this was a fairly informative video. You got in some really interesting spots with raising blocker bets, um, attacking min bets, playing against the 8648 on the regular table. Um, yeah, it's a shame we couldn't get in more spots against him. The spots we got in, he tempted to get the better of us, which is a shame. Well, that's going to happen. I mean, I'm not too worried about it. We should just be pleased to have the opportunity to play with these types of people. And it's dead easy to get frustrated when we run bad against them. But we should just be delighted that, that these players exist and they give us a chance to make some money. Yeah, I agree. And I think if we continue to let this video run and you played against him in front of the two hours, I'm sure that he would just be felted, you know, probably in less than an hour. Yeah, I would, imagine, I would imagine he wouldn't last two hours. 
So, but you know, overall, I think in terms of for educational purposes, you really showed how you can play exploitively against a player like that, and how you're going to be playing more thinly, and you're going to be putting money in much more lightly, and isolation raising, three betting, and playing aggressively post flop against a player like him versus you know um, a, a total net like the person sitting to your left. Yep, yeah, and if anyone needs a tool, isn't it? If anyone does have any questions about the things you've discussed, just leave a message under the video and I'm sure one of us will respond to it within 24 hours. We usually monitor the forum very regularly. Yes, and everybody, thanks so much for watching. We always appreciate your comments and feedbacks on our video. Let us know what you thought um, and we'll look forward to having you watch our next video. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Reg. No worries, mate. You're welcome.